what we're going to look at are, and so you already know what this is geared towards, is cutaneous manifestations of um, parasitoses. And um, obviously, I have no disclosures, unfortunately. Um, so here is a child who has some paritic papules. And you can see where that they're, they're located, which may give you a hint. This is an adult who has widespread excoriations and a dermatitis, and you see it's in some other areas which are interesting. And I think this is probably the one that will give it all away. Immunocompromised patients with this. So what do you think is going on? What's going on with these um, different manifestations of the same illness? Scabies. So you think it's scabies. Is that your final answer? You know, you know what? That's my final answer. You know what? That's correct. Um, that's what all of these patients have. And most of you know that immune compromised individuals have sometimes a really tough time in dealing with scabies. Um, just the usual CDC public health image, you know, generally you're looking at these areas that are noticed there, especially in the inner um, digital areas and the hands. Um, it's interesting that, you know, you can see it in the elbows and in the, um, the gluteal areas and in the genital areas. And when I was in medical school doing an ED rotation, um, I got assigned to see one child. It looked like he had scabies in his genital area. And the ED physician came out and, and apparently had seen his brother who had scabies in the gluteal area. And that was an interesting discussion to have with mom. So um, it, it is an interesting mite. Um, the way that you can diagnose this is to try and find a burrow, uh, the kind of classic looking burrows that you saw in the first slide. If you can find a burrow and you do skin scrapings more often than not, um, you can find one of three things. You can find either the mite, um, which I have done on occasion. You can find them, and sometimes they're live, but sometimes not. Um, you can see the detritus, the, the scabies caca, if you will, or you can see eggs. If you see any of those, you made a diagnosis pretty much. So treatment-wise, um, in kids greater than two and adults, you can use permethrin cream, um, from the neck down um, and leave it on for eight hours. You can repeat a week later, or you can use uh, a little bit newer treatment would be ivermectin, 200 microgram per kilo uh, per dose PO, and then repeat in two weeks. Uh, it's recommended that you increase uh, the absorption by taking with food. Um, it's probably not a bad idea to treat family in close contact, some of which may not be symptomatic, but can reinfect people. Um, you don't have to burn the clothes. I had some patients say, well, I guess I have to burn my clothes now. No, you just wash it in hot water and dry it in a heater, uh, you know, in a, um, in a clothes dryer. Um, if there's going to be an issue, if it's something that you can't really do that with, then you put it in a plastic bag, zip it up, and leave it for about two weeks. Uh, the mites generally don't survive them. Um, if they continue to itch after treatment, because remember that this is going down into dermis um, and burrowing along and you're going to leave cockeye, all these are inflammatory. Um, usually we talk about non-sedating antihistamines, but at night um, and even when you have active infection, uh, the mites tend to be a little bit more active at night. So sedating antihistamines might be a, a way to go about it. And on top of that, you could use uh, a topical corticosteroid uh, or lotion. Okay, now I seem to have lost the ability to move the slides. So <laughs> this, Go Christian, ahead. This, this used to be called what? They used to, uh, you know, the, the term was probably canceled these days, right? Everything's getting canceled. <laughs> um, but it, Yeah, because certain groups didn't like the terminology. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't like it either, but it was m misunderstood, right? It, it was Norwegian scabies. Not because people of Norwegian descent get it more, but because it was first described in Norway in the 19th century, right? Correct. Yeah, the preferred term now is crusted scabies. Crusted scabies, and, yeah. Um, we saw several years ago uh, an unfortunate gentleman who had AIDS, who very low CD4 counts, and he had it on his face. 
Um, and we had done really well, but you have to just keep retreating and retreating because the amount of scabies that's in just the crust is huge. So they're very infectious. And as we were trying to, you know, even going in all dressed up and you know, PPE and trying to remove some of the crust to get rid of the, the uh, parasitic burden, he had it over his ear and the crust that came off was an actual mold, including part of the internal part of his campus. It was I mean, it was interesting, but it was actually not, not great. But let's see if I can get this to work. Well, I'll have to do it this way, I guess. I don't know what's going on. There we go. Um, so with HIV, so if we're talking about crusted scabies, you know, it's the same dose and treatment as non-HIV, um, unless it's crusted, and we'll get to uh, the last bullet. Um, in pregnancy, permethrins are okay. Uh, but obviously don't use any organophosphates, um, so no myelothion or any of those kind of things, which we used to use but are, are not good things to use anymore. Kids under the age of two months, there is a sulfur ointment that can be used and is pretty effective. Um, and then for crusted scabies, you can use permethrin, 5% uh, cream daily for seven days and then two times a week until all the crusts are gone. Um, my preference is to use ivermectin in the dose that you see there on days 1, 2, 8, 9, and 15. Um, and what we used to use in people was lindane. Um, I did see many, many years ago a patient where that nobody documented in the old MAR and the non-EMRs that we had that a patient got treated with, um, with lindane, which is obviously can be toxic. So he got treated three times within a 24-hour period of time and became lindane toxic. Um, this is a gentleman who lives on a ranch in Texas. He's got some dogs. He walks barefoot um, quite a lot. And he comes in to see and he says, my foot itches like crazy. So what, is, what does this appear to be? And I know it's a foot. So this, this area, how would you describe that? Cutaneous larva migraines. Well, that would be an interesting answer, but how would you describe it? If you were writing on your physical exam, how would you just um, write that down? What would be your description of the lesion? It's a tunnel, right? Something looks like it's tunnel. Like a serpent. Like a serpent, I would say. Let's make it more fun. It, it sure does. So, you know, those are the kind of things that you should note. And your other answer is absolutely correct that, you know, this is cutaneous larva migraines. Um, we see it all over the place, you know, it's um, in southeastern U.S., I mean, Central America, South America, and parts of Africa and the Caribbean. Um, and, of course, you know, this is um, something that people have tried to treat. Uh, one of the things that used to be in fashion when I was a resident was that, well, if you can figure out the direction it's going, you can actually use liquid nitrogen and freeze where that the burrow looks like it's going. That actually doesn't work too well and it's not real comfortable. Um, the reason that, you know, so what is this? Uh, before we progress on, what is, what causes cutaneous larva migraines? And psilostoma? Yeah, it's a it's a hookworm, right? It's a dog hookworm. So people are an incidental host, and which means that you know here's this larva migrating around trying to um, be in a dog and replicate into its adult form, and it doesn't find a dog, so it just keeps looking and looking, so it's wandering around inside of you. Um, it stays in the dermis because it it lacks collagenase, so it can't actually get further into other tissues. It is self-limited. Um, it will eventually die on its own, but the itching, again, it's a foreign body inside of tissues so that it's going to be pretty paritic and that can last for even months afterwards. Um, the treatment is ivermectin or albendazole. Um, ivermectin tends to be a little bit more commonly used anymore. Occasionally, if you were to draw blood looking at this and looking at a white count, et cetera, which you don't usually have to do, um, you could see some eosinophilia, but it's really not worth the time and effort uh, for something just like this. It's better just to see it, recognize it, and treat it. Um, it's really uncommon unless that they're immune compromised because of systemic disease. This is an unfortunate guy who lived in Costa Rica who was 
trying to get some of his cats that lived in underneath the shed outside. So he crawled underneath because he thought one was either ill or I can't remember now um, or was injured. So he crawled under there. And then uh, a few days later, this is what he has all over his abdomen. And um, obviously this one was Ancelostoma brasiliense, which was a cat hookworm. So a little different. Um, obviously, we tell people if you're out on the beach and stuff, if there have been dogs around, etc., probably a good idea to wear shoes. Um, it's generally self-limited, as we already mentioned, because humans aren't the definitive host in the oral treatment. There's the doses from what we mentioned. Um, topical treatment, generally, yeah, you could put some steroids on it to try and decrease some of the pruritus, um, but really the best thing is just to uh, get it treated either albendazole or ivermectin. Okay, here's two youngsters who went swimming in a lake. Now they have itchy bumps in uncovered areas. As opposed to, I went swimming in the ocean, actually in Florida. And I have itchier, painful bumps in covered areas in this young lady. So what's going on? Is this the same thing? Or is it different? Well, for time, it's different because this one is anywhere. You see it's in uncovered areas. Um, we didn't have them pull down their bathing suits, but not any lesions in those areas. Whereas with this one, it tends to be clustered more where things were covered. So that tells you that something's underneath the clothing causing an issue. And it's actually two different things. The one on the left is swimmer's itch, and the one on the right is sea bather's eruption. So what is swimmer's itch? These are bird schistosomes. So people swimming out in freshwater lakes, uh, and you hear about this in a variety of different things, typical kind of board question. Um, so somebody went swimming, they have now bird schistosomes that have entered their skin, again, looking forward to uh, complete the replication in the bird. You are not a bird, so all you get out of this is a, a lousy pruritic rash. Um, not really too much to do with this except to let it run its course, antihistamines and topical steroids. And actually, if you're in California, it's a reportable disease, but uh, to my knowledge, not any place else. What you're seeing on the right is uh, similar to other um, problems that you can encounter uh, in the sea, like with jellyfish, etc. And that's what this is. It's a small little jellyfish that has nematocysts. Um, so you're looking at salt water versus freshwater exposure. Um, the thimble jellyfish, uh, Lunuche, um, I can't even pronounce it today. So I'll let Dr. Vega pronounce it because she's better than I am with this. Um, and then Edward Celia leniata, uh, which is an anemone. These can be very small and they can get you know into water and underneath bathing suits. And so now that you, you're there, you trigger these nematocysts and you essentially get stung. Um, so that's what happens with this. And again, it's, it's, if you will, it's a sting, it's a poison. So, um, not really too much to do about that, except make, make people comfortable, uh, and it resolves on its own. Um, this should give you a big hint in this person who says that their head itches. So what do you see? You see hair, right? I hope. Anything else? Head lice. Sure. What, do you, what are you actually seeing on the hair? What are those? I'm those not are the sure. nits. Are the eggs or the nests? Sure, they're the nits. They're the eggs. Remember that you know, the louse will attach its eggs onto hair, and that's where they develop and hatch, and that's how that you and that's what you see in the upper right hand side are the, the nits that are on the hair. So there's one that's actually uh, has a larva in it. Uh, you can see these later on that tend to be empty. Um, and I don't know that I can show you. This one down in the bottom, can you see the arrow? Um, that one's probably alive. This one I can't tell, but since it's a little wider, um, probably is already erupted from the, from the nit, from the egg. Um, so again, this is not uncommon to cause people to have, you know, itching in their head, occipital pruritus. Um, generally, this breaks out where there's a lot of close contact. So you can see this 
in you know daycare centers, schools, um, places where that there's close contact with individuals, uh, homeless shelters, etc. Occasionally in jails, sometimes. Um, the lice, though, with this, and as you see the picture of the head lust, they really, they have hooks on them, and they can attach themselves to the hair, and they can live um, on you for quite a period of time, but they can actually live off of you for about 30 days. Uh, the time it takes to go from an, an, an egg to an adult is roughly a little over two weeks. So, some things to think about. Um, this picture was courtesy of Dr. Ayler a few years ago. Because one of the things that people will do, and dermatologists like to do this, is they use their woods lamp to try and look at bacterial infections, you know, to see if it'll fluoresce a certain color. They use a, a woods lamp as well, and sometimes looking uh, easily to see if they can see nits on a, a hair shaft. And um, Dr. Ayler found one of these wonderful black lights, I think, on Amazon. So if you have a case you're not sure about, talk to him. He may let you use his black light. As you see, it's also a good urine detector for dogs. And uh, Amazon Prime benefits too. <laughs> Let's not forget those. <laughs> oh, great. Um, so obviously the first thing to look at is with this, um, you're going to do a little mini um, outbreak, if you will. You want to screen close contacts for infestation. If it's a child, you probably should inform the school because there's probably going to be other uh, kids at school who've been infected and may or may not be itching at that point. Uh, you need to wash anything that's come in contact with that child's uh, or that person's hair, including you know hats, clothing, hairbrushes. You just have to put them in hot water, put them in a dryer for about five minutes. Uh, the temperature that's quoted is about 128.3 degrees Fahrenheit, kills the, um, the eggs and lice. Um, most people probably use uh, either prescription. Um, there are a lot of over-the-counter products I'll talk about in just a second. And there's no need to treat if there's no lice and if it looks like that the nits are empty. Um, but most individuals you know, would just probably go ahead and treat anyway because the school's going to tell your kids you can't come back until they're treated. So over-the-counter-wise, uh, there's a 1% permethrin lotion. The brand name is NYX. It's not too expensive. I think it, you can find it for probably close to around $20. It's 120 ml uh, bottle of that. You apply it to the hair, uh, leave it on for about 10 minutes, rinse it off, and then repeat it again in one to two weeks. Um, it can be used anywhere from two months of age up through uh, adult age. The other option that you have are the permethrins or pipironyl butoxide, which is RID. The other brand name is Pronto. And it's the same instructions, and that can be used in um, individuals age two years up to adults. Uh, Prescription-wise, there's a few other choices. Uh, you can, again, use ivermectin lotion. It's expensive. Um, it works without combing. And that's the other thing you get with the over-the-counters is trying to comb out the nits because some of those will probably have live larvae in them. And you, you want to, um, again, decrease the amount of potential births coming out of the nets as you can. So if you will, kind of source control. Um, the oral formulation of um, ivermectin is not FDA approved to treat um, pediculosis capitis. Benzyl alcohol lotion is available. It's every seven days times two doses. It's not uh, ovicidal though, but it, it may prevent the nymphs from surviving if they are already erupted from the egg. Uh, the age span is six months to adults. You um, use the amount applied depending on how much hair that there is. So um, it, there's guidance uh, with the enclosure for that on how to use it. Um, there is a malathion lotion. It's an organophosphate. I probably would steer clear of organophosphates. Um, I'm just a little anxious about using that, especially in younger age people. Um, but the other one that was more recently approved a couple of years ago was Spinosad. It's a 0.9% suspension. It's also pricey, but it is ov uh, ovicidal and pediculocidal. So if you really want uh, to try and ensure killing of both uh, larval and adults, then um, this might be a way to go. Although, again, it's pretty pricey. Uh, the age group there is six months to it, um, up to adulthood. This person comes in and said that they are itchy and they have a rash all over. And you see this when they go to take off their pants in one of the seams in the 
the um, pant legs. What do you think's going on? They were eating Rice Krispies and it fell into their pants. Probably not. I'll give you a hint. So what's the other name for pediculosis corporis? Body lice, right? So we don't think about head lice really transmitting any kind of other infections. They're more of a nuisance. Um, this one's a little different, remember? This one can present with dermatitis or pruritus. This is also, again, where there's a lot of crowding uh, in homeless areas, refugee camps, other areas where people get crowded together and hygiene is not so great. Um, so they live in clothing more often than not, uh, no matter what it is. Uh, it can be on blankets um, and the seams of clothing where they can hide. They can transmit disease. Obviously, you're looking at endemic type of trench fever and relapsing fever that have been discussed in some of our other um, noontime lectures. And the treatment is actually the same as head lice. Um, the rash is a little different. It is the actually the opposite of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The most common louse associated, or I'm sorry, the most common rickettsia associated with this is rickettsia palenzechii, um, which is the body louse, uh, and can be found in flying squirrels. So yes, that was I think I gave a hint in one of the discussions that you know the the squirrel's name was Rocky, so that might help. Um, manifestations of endemic typhus include fever, chills, headaches. Remember the rash is going to spare the palms, soles, and the face, and it generally starts in the axillary areas and then um, goes out in more of a, a truncal distribution. Uh, the illness can be prolonged, and um, as with other rickettsia, uh, the treatment of choice is doxycycline. This person is telling you they have black dots all over themselves. And you thought, well, that's interesting. Huh, what's going on with that? So let's have a closer look. What do you see? What is this? And what is this? And what is that? Well, and what is that? Oh. <laughs> They're all related. So what is this? This crabs? Yeah. And what is this? Crabs eat, then crabs do what? They go to the bathroom. They do. <laughs> Excellent. So again, this is some of the things that you, you might see, and that's just, you know, um, crab feces. So that's generally what we would be looking for if you saw it um, not on the body. And again, this is just looking um, you know, pretty close. And it's a little bit more diffuse than this picture because of where it's overlying on the skin. So you have to look carefully. And um, it can be more than just the genital area. It can be elsewhere. But generally, that's where you see it. Where else can you see it? You see a picture of it here. It can be on the eyelashes. So anywhere that there's hair, you can see crab lice, predicolosis pubis, uh, attaching with these nice little hooks that hold it on to hair follicles so that they can feed using the anterior end of their body to feed on us. Um, the, the treatment's exactly the same as with head lice. Uh, they generally do not transmit other infections. And you, well, I'm sorry, um, you generally don't want uh, to put anything uh, around the eye. There is an ophthalmic petroleum ointment which works really well to essentially suffocate them. They use two to four times a day for about 10 days. So um, that's one of the other areas. And how, I mean, you can, it's hard to tell that these are lice, but they, this one maybe you can see. It looks like that you can see some of the, um, the extremities on there, but this is kind of the tip off. There's the, the caca. Okay, this is a linear urticarial plaque that is fast moving. That may be a description you see in a board question. Always remember it's linear. It tends to be urticarial. And you look at it, it looks like a hive, but a long hive, and it's moving. So what is it? 
Remember, that's larva currens. This is strongyloidiasis. Generally, we think of strongy, you know, um, in the GI tract, and larva can certainly get into the human body and cause issues. But this is the one that you can see cutaneously um, in generally uh, immune competent individuals. This is just another picture to give you an idea, and you can kind of see another little one over here as well. Um, but they are characterized, and I think this description is what you would probably write in your physical exam. They are serpiginous to a degree. They're raised, they're erythematous tracts, and they can move. They can move 5 to 15 centimeters an hour. So it's a lot faster than uh, cutaneous larva migraines. Those generally tend not to move real fast during the days, but these can, as you see. Um, the other one that we're all well aware of is disseminated, disseminated strongylordiasis. This is hyperinfection. And the key word here that you may see is a thumbprint purpura. And if you look at some of these, it kind of does, and some of these look like a thumbprint. Um, Christian told me it looks more like a thumbprint if you're on acid, but I don't know. He won't share. I'm just teasing. Um, so remember those terms, the thumbprint purpura and larva currents with what? This fast-moving plaque. Here's a person who's been out hiking, and I bet you can already figure out what it is. What do you see? Target lesion with lines. Absolutely. Yeah, the description is it's a target lesion or a bullseye lesion because there you have one area, you see some clearing, and now you're seeing the outside margin. So, yeah, you can see that with kind of a few things, but the most common thing with this scenario that I've been out sort of hiking would be Lyme disease or um, perhaps, you know, with Starry. But so you're looking at erythema migrans um, and, you know, you're looking at either Ixodes ticks or amblyoma ticks, um, as we've talked about in some other of our um, discussions. That's about what you would see. And what you want to know, if the person knows, they may not know. They may not even know they've been bitten by a tick because some of these can be a lymphal um, stage of a tick and be literally about the head of a pin. And it's hard to see that. Um, so those are the kind of things we want to look at. We want to make sure that if it's been there for more than 48 hours, now they're at a risk uh, of getting disease. If it's less than 24 hours, probably you don't need to do anything. Just keep an eye on the area. Um, so that's one question, again, that they may or may not know about. But that's how, more often than not, you see um, the tick embedded. The best thing is to get a set of um, tweezers. Um, some of us in the medical field may have some mosquito, mosquito forceps at home. You could try that as well. What do you not want to do? You don't want to squeeze the abdomen. You don't want any contents, uh, gastric contents, et cetera, going back into you because you're going to spread spirochetes into your body. So you want this as close to the proboscis area as possible and pull it out. Um, well, I'm sorry. Um, so the best treatment of choice, as most of you know, is doxycycline. Um, Profi, if it's been there for 48 hours, is 200 milligram dose times one uh, if you remove the tick. Uh, it's best if it can be identified. And what you want to identify, is it a black leg tick? Uh, so that's what would be helpful, and, and I'm sorry, it keeps going. Um, if it's not contraindicated by age, um, again, doxycycline. Actually, um, there's great data that you can use doxycycline even in kids um, that are very young, just not, unfortunately, at this time during pregnancy, because then we do worry about enamel discoloration, especially bone growth um, in our incubating children, but not so much as kids. Um, this is out of um, Journal of Allergy Immunology, or Journal of, um, now I'm blanking, AAD, Allergy and Associated Diseases, in 2011. Um, just talking about this, this is outside of this discussion, but how to treat. And there now is um, a new document that I think is on the next um, slide talking about this. This is from CDC. They did a very nice presentation last month uh, regarding Lyme disease. And uh, with kids less than 45 kilos, the treatment is 4.4 milligram per kilo orally, maximum dose to 200 milligrams, one-time dose. And a short course of doxycycline is safe to use in all ages of children, just not during pregnancy. 
Um, this just came out this year, and it was another combination of the Academy of Neurology, American College of Rheumatology, and IDSA for the 2020 guidelines for the prevention and diagnosis of treatment of Lyme disease. So if you haven't reviewed it, it is something uh, to take a look at. Uh, there are some changes in this, but about many things didn't change. Okay, what happened to my child's eye? You see that the palpe palpebra are swollen. There's a small crust at the outer canthal area, and this child lives in Central America. What would you think of? Reduvi bug. <gasps> What's another name for a reduvid bug? There's a couple of different names that people will mention to you. Chagas. No, the, the other name for a reduvid bug. It's called a kissing, kissing bug. bug or an assassin bug. <laughs> um, and the reason, and you're correct, there's a picture of a reduvid bug. What it does, and I think it, it just does this as an insult to the human or whatever it bites, is after it feeds, it turns around and defecates in the area where it was feeding. I don't know if it's marking territory or what, but that's where that you're getting, guess what, coming out of this infected reduvid bug. So what does a reduvid bug give you? I know it gives you T. cruzii, but what stage? Do you remember? Okay. Something to think about. Um, so when we think about Chagas disease, we're thinking Central and South America. What we were talking about was Romagna sign uh, with palpebral edema. Um, if it's ulcerated, you also think of a shagoma, and you can actually um, see on sometimes h &E, but with a biopsy, um, T. cruzii uh, promastigotes in that area. Um, most of the time, everybody thinks about the cardiac involvement with Chagas disease, but there are also GI involvements, which is outside the, this discussion per se. Um, so diagnosis is to uh, try acutely is to get a smear culture, or you can do PCR, um, to try and make a diagnosis. Um, the most effective treatment is going to be um, bedsnitazole. Uh, you can get nifurtamox through CDC drug service. There's a phone number if you need it uh, or the web page where you can contact individuals at CDC and they're going to ask you a lot of questions and would probably like to have some of your diagnostic material. Um, remember that this is what you're looking for in tissue, the trypanomastigotes in tissue. The amastigotes are in blood. So that's what we used to see now that we're screening blood, uh, trying to screen to prevent Chagas. Um, that's what we're looking for in blood. Um, you can uh, have people who've had Chagas, it becomes inactivated, but if they become uh, immunosuppressed, it can reactivate. And it is a reportable disease in Texas. Um, the treatment is going to be with either benzonidazole or nifertamox. Here's a person who has a severe headache, fever, and body aches in the summer, and they're flu negative. And then two to three days later, they got a rash on their hands and feet. This was foreshadowed many slides in the past. So when you're thinking of rashes on the hand, what do you think of? Rocky Mountain spotted fever. That's usually about three days or so after the initial um, symptoms present. And it's actually not a good sign when you start seeing rashes appear with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. What else do you think about with rashes on the hands? Just two more things. Syphilis and cough. Sure. Exactly. What else? One viral disease you need to think of too. that's had an uptick when kids don't get vaccinated and they have occasionally white spots in their mouth 15% of the time. Measles. So you can see a rash on the hands with measles. But the thing to think about, obviously most people think of syphilis, but the rash isn't a particular rash like that. It's different. So we're looking at rickettsia rickettsii, and it's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, so the most common place to see Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is where? 
Right now, not Rocky Mountain. <laughs> you see that where it, it can be, but it's really more of an East Coast disease. Um, and I would tell you the people in North and South Carolina, if they see a rash, they're going to think of Rocky Mountain spotted fever generally before anything else if people have been outside and hiking around. Um, so again, the thing to think about, fear, fever, chills, headache, and you say, God, it sounds like COVID almost. And it, that's what we end up doing is trying to test and see what's going on. Um, if you see the rash, that, that certainly can help, but the rash doesn't always appear in people. And again, the treatment is going to be doxycycline. Um, a little bit better picture of the rash, and here you see a, a very small child uh, at the bottom. Um, things to think about lab-wise, uh, thrombocytopenia, like you can see with ehrlichiosis, etc. Uh, hyponatremia, something to think about, but not necessarily specific for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And untreated in some people, mortality up to 25%. So, you know, this is something that we're all kind of attuned to and we think about, and they may not remember that they've been bitten by a tick. Um, and the treatment of choice is, as we already mentioned. Um, here's a lady that asks you a very simple question. This is going on for a while. What's happening to my face? It's been going on for years. Um, she doesn't see medical personnel very often at all. She's totally asymptomatic, and this deformity has been worsening um, over the years. What do you think? involving, you know, her nose from the bridge of her nose to the labial side uh, and her upper lip. And she lives in Central America. She could live in South America. This is cutaneous leishmaniasis. And remember that there's cutaneous manifestations, mucocutaneous manifestations of old world and new world. Um, the old world not really seen so much um, in the Americas as uh, Lishmania Major, Tropicana, and Phantom, and Ethiopia. Ethiopia, if I can talk today. Uh, New World, we think of the Mexicana Brasiliensis, and then Visceral, uh, Lishmaniasis, Donovanii, and Phantom as well. Um, one of the fellows years ago used to say, oh, dumb, dumb fever, and then would call me dumb, dumb. So I must have had Lishmaniasis. Um, these are the kind of things we think about with old world. Uh, I think we're, we probably all have seen, you know, the pictures of kids with swollen abdomen with Lishmania. Um, this kind of a localized eruption, more of a diffuse re uh, eruption um, on the eye. Uh, all of these with ulcers are things to think about. Uh, but new world is a little bit different. Remember that the vector is a sand fly. Um, Probably best if you could remember the name of the sand fly, but remember it's a sand fly, Lutzomia species, and you're getting promastigotes when it's taking a blood meal. Um, the mucocutaneous part of this is what you saw with the lady was called a spundia, and I think most of you probably know that. The other thing is taper face named after a taper because it kind of does look like that as you start eroding away the nasal septum and part of the lip. Uh, the other two things to think about that commonly uh, will be discussed in board reviews are chiclero ulcers, which you see on the ears, uh, and uh, uta in Peru uh, into the face. And you see these different manifestations. All of this is leishmaniasis. Um, same kind of thing with this. This is a spondium. Uh, chiclero ear. Uh, this gentleman apparently from the description, obviously not my pictures, but um, took the child with him a lot of times as he goes to harvest um, the sap from gum trees and would be, bit, uh, be bitten by uh, sand flies. Um, again, these um, actually not very painful ulcers at all. Um, they, they are not clean based when you look at them, so it probably is not going to be a syphilitic ulcer, although it could be confused with something else called by a treponine. Uh, so what else could it be? What other things, and although it's becoming very uncommon, what else can be caused by uh, treponema, like treponema protenue, et cetera, and cause ulcers in people? Anyone? Yaws? So just some other things to think about. Um, so again, um, this starts out as a nodule, starts expanding, as it generally tends to be painless unless it gets super infected. Um, and the therapy with this that was discussed was, you know, with uh, 
treat topically cryotherapy versus heat or systemic. And I think probably most people are going to use systemic. Um, but the best thing is we're used to is travel history. Uh, the CDC would be happy to help you to diagnose this. And they're going to ask you for the fourth bullet down. They want to have tissue. They want a sterile punch biopsy from the board of the ulcer uh, for H&E. They want a roll tissue uh, smear on glass slide and fix it with methanol and heme sustain. And if you have it available, um, they may send it to you if you call them early on. If that's what you think is going on is um, you can send them RMPI media uh, if you can get it. Or they can send you uh, Nicole Noivy uh, McNeil medium. And I can't see who's on here, but Dr. Canella, you have any words of wisdom as to what you've been able to use for Lishmania during your experiences? Or he may not be on here. I can't tell. Yeah, I don't think Dr. Canella is on at the moment. Okay. He has some experience um, with uh, some of his rotations uh, managing Lishmania. Um, but the drug of choice still for most of this is uh, sodium stibagluconate that you have to get from CDC. There are some other things that are evolving, and you know we have a lot of research ongoing over at College of Public Health. And um, I think Dr. Kim has also done some Lishmania work. Um, here's one that's not so uncommon. Unfortunately, I went on a trip last week, and I have this rash, and it itches. And of course, you know, the usual question is, where'd you go? What did you do? Well, I went so-and-so and I stayed at this cheap motel because, you know, the motels are hard to get anything anymore. And so I, I slept at this sub motel six. And so, but again, describing what do you see? You see these lesions. Uh, unfortunately, I can't make them any bigger. They tend to blur, but they're you see a few here, and then you see a few here, and then you see some here. They're, they're kind of linear. They're not completely linear, but they do follow a path. And that's kind of a giveaway when you're looking at things that tend to be linear. Um, this looks like it's going to be an arthropod-based issue, and it is. It's what people would call a rash of straight lines. Um, is probably one of the considerations would be bed bugs. As you can see in this, they're not that big. Um, so it's something to think about. And I had a colleague who used to tell me that, yes, if you have bed bugs, you are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, they generally tend to feed more at night. So I guess you'd be more late night snack. But um, most of this is just itching. They really don't transmit um, diseases at all. They're a nuisance. There was one report of them maybe transmitting MRSA, but that's, that would be, that's why it's a case report. Um, getting rid of them can be difficult. But um, for those of you who travel, um, I haven't looked at these recently, so I can't confirm that they're still available. But there are, there are some registries of places that have had known bed bugs. So it is something to um, perhaps, if you're not sure, take the sheets down, look at the seams around the mattress um, in the uh, pull-out shelves and other things that uh, are in the rooms just to make sure if, if you can see them, you may want to request another room or maybe want to request another hotel if you could get it. Uh, here's a person who went to the beach in Belize, and this lesion tends to be getting bigger. And um, I'll just do a couple more and we'll finish. This is a very characteristic appearance. So make sure that you remember this. It, it looks kind of almost vesicular, and it's not, but it's got this dark center. Very characteristic for whatever this is. So what is it? This is tungiasis. This is a sand flea. And remember that sand fleas, um, they, they don't jump well at all. So that's why you see them predominantly in the feed, although occasionally seen when people are lying on sand. Um, the gravid females, which is what you're seeing there, are entering to feed. So you're seeing part of their body, and what you're seeing here is their posterior derriere sticking out. The black dot is the back end of the flea. They can get fairly large. The treatment of choice is to remove the flea. Um, and you can do that in a number of different ways. You can either try and, and surgically remove it. Uh, some people try and suffocate it, but um, most people would just like to get it out of there. So um, generally, that's what is recommended is just to remove it. It certainly can scar. It's a pretty large area. 
and it's uh, in sand in lots of different areas, as you can see uh, around in the world. Um, this is another one that, it, you know, just looking at it should make you think of the illness. This is pretty characteristic. You're seeing this localized erythema, maybe a little bit of purulence, but this. And you see that there's an indentation. And that's what the person came in. It hurts. It's red. I think I have a boil. By the way, I was on vacation four weeks ago, and they were over at the beach. And there were lots of flies around. So what is that? Again, it's another larva. This is furuncular myiasis. This is a larva of, if you will, a bot fly or larval fly, or in some areas of the world, a, a tumbu fly. Um, these hooks help hold it inside of the skin while that it's incubating in you. It will uh, go out of its larval stage and erupt into a fly and, and basically crawl out of your skin. I don't think most people would like for it to do that. Um, but that's what you can see. Occasionally, these um, flies, a diptera fly, can sometimes lay their eggs on skin or clothing, and then you can get infected that way. And occasionally, mosquitoes will pick them up uh, and transport them around. But I think most of the time, it's going to be bot flies laying eggs on people, and it doesn't take long for them to deposit them on skin. The larva gets and grows into the skin, creates this nodule that you saw with the punctum, and more often than not has some kind of a drainage, some kind of serous sanguinous drainage. So again, you can either try and occlude it with petroleum jelly and smother it, um, try and uh, either use ivermectin orally, uh, or just surgically excise it. And that's it, and I appreciate taking the time. Sorry it took me a while to get on the here, um, but I hope it was worthwhile, and just some visual reminders of some things that you might see um, in some of the board questions.